The mission of the Pennsylvania Department of Education is to ensure that every learner has access to a world-class education system. Welcome to PDE Presents, a podcast series for lifelong learners that's dedicated to elevating voices across the Commonwealth. And now your host, Noe Ortega. PDE Presents is part of a broader strategy by the Pennsylvania Department of Education aimed at changing the way we think and talk about the public mission and the public good outcomes of ed- education, both in the Commonwealth and across the nation. This podcast invites school leaders, educators, and other key stakeholders to participate in a conversation that unpacks contemporary topics in education with a focus on equity. Welcome to PDE Presents. I'm your host, Noe Ortega. My guest today is Dr. Dan Greenstein, the Chancellor of the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, a state system more commonly referred to as PASHI. Chancellor Greenstein, or more lovingly referred to as Chancellor Dan, as his communications, our communications team found out in digging through your social media footprint, serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the state system, which operates 14 public universities, serves nearly 100,000 degree-seeking students, and thousands more enrolled in certificate and other career development programs. Chancellor Dan, welcome to PDE Presents. It's great. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Welcome. So, Chancellor Dan, for those who may, might be meeting you virtually for the first time, what is something that you might be willing to share with our listeners about who you are as a professional and how you approach your work? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, you know, I guess in so many respects, I, I, I'm my parents' child, uh, you know, a product of the 60s. Um, the Great Society had a, hu- had a huge impact on them. Uh, they turned their attention to education reform, to the development of, you know, planned communities. Um, and then they oriented their child in the same direction, you know. So while other kids were out doing sandlot baseball or whatever they did in the summer, I was enrolled in programs on urban regeneration, race relations, drug addiction, you know, and working in summer programs uh, with for kids with cerebral palsy. So, you know, and it just sort of established a mentality uh, in, uh, to, to, to pay it forward, to, 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 to serve those in need. And, uh, you know, I pursued that in college as a social historian, you know, studying with a then new generation of leading historians who were giving voice to the unheard in our history and really digging into issues of class, race and gender and how they shaped our culture. And then you know, as a professional, just uh, I don't know whether it was finding opportunities to pay it forward or just stumbling into them, but, you know, just a succession of those uh, over a period of many years, um, you know, uh, University of California launching an online initiative because the Great Recession left 400,000 students in California without a place in higher ed, mostly black, black and brown students. And this was an attempt to redress that imbalance. The Gates Foundation, as the director of their higher ed program, you know, taking a program which was investing in improving outcomes for low-income students who are attending college uh, to one that focus on low-income students and students of color uh, because race and I mean income is not a proxy for race and you could succeed with income goals and fail on uh, race equity goals and then you know obviously uh, when I came to the Pennsylvania state system frankly I jumped at the opportunity to find help find a means of sustaining public higher education that's you know was significantly at risk frankly as you know um, and, and while it's at risk, it's also the only pathway so for so many low income, rural, black uh, and brown Pennsylvanians. So, uh, you know, it's sort of a package there. As a, as a member of the Board of Governors for PASHI as well, it's great to have you in Pennsylvania to lead the PASHI system. So I appreciate the introduction. You know, in terms of someone who's built a career on serving those in need, the past several years, Chancellor Dan has really been a time that's really changed the educational landscape, many of us feel like forever. What do you feel is one of the most pressing matters in the field of higher education? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. And we've talked, actually, you and I have talked about this. You know, uh, the pandemic, I think, has really just exposed profound cracks in our practice, in our systems, our education systems. And it's not like we didn't know about those cracks, but I think they've just been illuminated in a really harsh light by our current experience. And and, and I don't want to suggest that we haven't been addressing them. I'm speaking we, higher education generally. We have over the years. Um, But I I think there's a kind of a renewed sense of urgency because, you know, through the exposure of the pandemic, I think we realize really how deep and structural these problems are. And, 
You know, I, 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 I thought of a few and there's just so many, but you know, the digital divide is one that springs to mind, profoundly challenging, not just for uh, low income students, but for rural students, especially in Pennsylvania, where north of, you know, Route 80, there's pretty limited broadband coverage, which has a profound impact on, you know, education when students are, the, that, the access to that education is intermediated by, intermediated by the internet. You know, um, I, I think the uh, move to a remote and hybrid models of instruction have exposed real profound challenges or to, um, in our student supports generally, uh, whether it's advising, career services, mental health and wellness uh, supports, et cetera. Um, you know, a couple things. I, I just think we need a fundamental reset. And, um, you know, we are not equipped to deal with the challenges that, that existed before the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic layers on top of that. And, you know, and, 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 and the kind of models that are out there that look promising are the ones that offer a more holistic approach. A student has a kind of a, a navigating aid, a concierge model, they call it sometimes, where a student has a single point of contact to access lots of different, and somebody has a 360 degree view of that student and their progress. I, you, we're, I think that this has uh, obviously sort of exposed the challenges that we're facing, carrying historic models forward. And then the last one, and you know this, is, is the equity gaps. I mean, you look at all the data on enrollment, on student outcomes, and they are profoundly disturbing. I and mean, they were disturbing before the pandemic, but the pandemic exacerbates the sort of divide between uh, access to and uh, completion of uh, higher education degrees that exists between black, brown, and white students and between low and, 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 and higher income students. And I, I want to pause here because, and I still don't understand this, to be perfectly honest, that those trends which have been pretty uniform across the country have not borne out in the Pennsylvania State System universities, that our enrollments do not appear to have been, uh, our, our enrollments appear to have been on track with what we expected so far this year. Um, and they don't seem to have had differential impacts by income or race. Uh, and, and we're still working through the data, but, and I, you know, if that's the result, I'm not sure I understand why. Uh, it suggests to me that our universities, you know, despite the many challenges that they have, you know, their affordability advantage, their local nature, um, uh, they're, they're known uh, by the communities surrounding them has potentially helped us overcome some of those challenges. But the broader national perspective is, uh, uh, per picture is, is quite concerning. Yeah, and I think with every passing day, we're learning more and more about what these long lasting impacts are gonna be. And it'll be interesting to see what some of those differences in impact across the various sectors, including PASHI would be. Uh, so tell us a little bit, uh, Chancellor Dang, you've mentioned a few things in terms of, of issues, some concerns with regards to higher education, uh, some of those who are, uh, some of which are impacting PASHI. What are you, your team doing to sort of break down some of the barriers, challenges, or even restructuring systems and institutions, and then keeping equity in the forefront as well? Yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of things here. I sort of take it at the kind of, um, practice level first, and then maybe a couple of transformational things. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of see this as a, as a matter of exercising self-discipline, right? It, it, in our lives, I, mean, I know it's true for you. I mean, the crush of transactions that we have to execute every day, I mean, the volume of business is just enormous. And it really requires discipline to, to force oneself to pause and ask, probing questions about, you know, whatever the next transa transaction is and what, what are the potential equity impacts of that action, right? It, it just requires that uh, discipline to provide that level of thoughtfulness. And, 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 and I just go a little bit deeper into that because I don't think this is something that can be done alone, you know, because inevitably we are bound in our thinking by our worldviews and our experiences, you know, so for me, it's a matter of ensuring that I'm surrounded by diverse voices on my teams. And I don't mean diverse, just, I mean, it in the broadest possible way, not just, you know, by demographic characteristic, race, ethnicity, et cetera, but also by perspective, right? And, and, and that's sur be, being surrounded, is not just surrounded by my team at the office of the chancellor or my team of presidents, uh, but also by, you know, a board. Um, uh, I think a second aspect is supporting team members and even board members in, in having those conversations which are really focused on equity impacts. And those don't come naturally to folks, uh, to most folks. And so how do you, you know, make a team, make a place, a, a place to have a safe conversation? How do you make it safe? And the conversations are difficult. 
And they often involve people in vigorous debate because they think differently about equity and what equity means and that sort of thing. They can be uncomfortable. And, 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 and so, you know, providing that training and support to enable people to have, you know, they're called courageous conversations, difficult conversations is, is, is an aspect. Making time, because it's not just what you learn from your team, you know, to talk to people. And I know you're great at this because, you know, you're, you're, you're out and about and you need to be, I need to be, um, and especially with our students, uh, you know, to make time to, to hear student voices, diverse voices, to listen, you know, carefully to challenges that, that, that people are facing. I, I get to do that through by visiting universities, uh, you know, every each one of our universities I visit every uh, every term and then obviously in countless other, you know, focus groups and advisory groups, et cetera. Um, and then look outside, you know, especially in big systems, big organizations where there's a lot of expertise and a lot of great work going on. You know, you kind of be, it's, it, there's a, you know, one, partly a matter of time and time management, but there's a kind of a, a, a pull to become almost parochial. And, and, and it's important to fight against that, to look outside and to see what other, what are others doing uh, that are, are, are making progress in this space and how can we adapt those practices and those models. Um, and so making time for that kind of survey of the landscape, interacting with others externally. So some of that, I, I sort of approach it from a practice perspective. Um, obviously we can talk about some of the structural work as, as well, if that's helpful, but uh, that was sort of my starting point. Sure, sure. No, and I appreciate that. And I think one of the things that is really challenging about the work, particularly from an equity lens, is that it's both differentiated, right, as you invite various perspectives, but it's also inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> and it's sort of an interesting balance as you try to communicate that to various folks. I wonder, uh, Chancellor Dana, a lot of the listeners that are thinking about things that they can put in place, and you said, yeah. you know, surrounding yourselves with the right team, and doing things that can work at, at sort of the system level, executive level. Yeah. What then do you see sort of the trickle down impact of those changes and restructuring having on students specifically? And yeah. how do they stand to benefit from some of these uh, uh, structural changes that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, in so many different ways. And I, you know, I'm glad to say that um, at here at the Pennsylvania State System, our, uh, it, 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 it looks like we're beginning to show the results of several years of really focused attention. They're showing up in, you know, improved access for underrepresented minority students, so growth in their enrollment, uh, some movement finally against the equity gaps that exist in terms of student outcomes, um, uh, you know, some movement in terms of diversification of faculty and staff. So some of the key indicators are beginning to sort of show progress. Um, and they don't happen overnight, and you know this. I mean, this is long, hard, consistent effort, and and the indicators move super slowly. But, you know, um, but I'm proud of that, and I think our folks should be proud of that. I mean, some of the 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 good news, I think, from a practice perspective, is that there's emerging playbooks out there that are built on data and research. So it's possible to now in a way that it probably wasn't 10 or 15 years ago to identify practices that work that have an evidence base under them and then to begin to think about so i always again it goes back to that point earlier looking outside i'm per particularly sensitive to this having spent six years at the gates foundation investing in the identification and uh, of practices that work and and and, and um you know building an evidence base under them. a couple of highlights for me that are really beginning to uh, you know show progress here one of them is, is it's it's so obvious, but it's so often overlooked, is that, you know, begin by assessing the problem analytically with data, you know, understand where we are, what are our enrollments looking like, what are our students, where are students dropping away, you know, where are we seeing more and less progress with diversification of, of staff and faculty, As, you know, use the data, give it visibility, let everybody look at it. And then use the data, the second thing, and we learn this from Ed Trust, from IHEP, from other national organizations who've been active, use the data to decide where to focus efforts and to establish clear and measurable goals, whether it's with respect of, you know, I want to see uh, underrepresented minority graduation rates improve by 10% over, you know, X number of years, or I want to see this growth in the um, diversity of our faculty and staff. And, and we've done that. So we've used the data, we've decided where to focus our efforts in a system like ours, you know, you see those kinds of uh, strategic or, you know, goal oriented work coming at two levels, one at the university, each one of our universities has made diversity, equity, and inclusion a priority. They, they land on different goals. You know, I think most are really focusing on student success. Some are looking at diversity of uh, staff, some are looking at free speech. So there's always a combination. They're always somewhat different, which is good. 
Um, at the system level, it's about establishing clear expectations. You know, there is an expectation that our presidents and their universities focus on imp making their campuses more diverse, more equitable with respect of their outcomes and inclusive with respect of making sure everybody feels welcome and at home um, and hold our universities accountable for reaching those goals. And we do some work on sort of shared out. There's things that make sense to do collectively. You know, we've done a lot on free speech. Uh, we've just implemented a sort of mandatory training for all faculty, staff and students. Uh, we have a coordinated approach to communication. So I think, you know, that sort of you start with the data, use the data to identify clear goals and strategies. And then, you know, a couple of other things, be clear in establishing expectations. The board has been clear. The chancellor needs to be clear, but everybody needs, a president needs to be clear about their expectations, a chair of a department, a dean. This requires all of us to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a priority and to expect that of our colleagues. Um, so that's important. And then finally training, and you know, it could go on forever. I think training is really important. We, I brought this up earlier. You know, this is not necessary. You know, if everybody knew how to do this work well, this would the, the challenges that we're facing would not be here and they would have not have been here for so long. So we just have to own the fact that maybe we need to learn and train. And there are any number of great starting points. I was recently in touch with the, uh, Amer uh, the AAC and use Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Group. They're, they're fantastic, right? But there are many, many other resources, you know, uh, folks who can come in and really starting at the leadership level help gain comfort and competence in having difficult decisions and making difficult uh making difficult decisions and moving forward uh so yeah i think uh, training uh, some of the stuff i've talked about before discipline all that's uh, important i guess the last thing is communication you know this is tough stuff but it deserves a kind of warts and all approach you know there's progress but there are also enormous challenges let's talk about them let's be willing to talk about them to engage with folks to listen uh with empathy um, so communications is critical here too. Appreciate that. And I think what you've offered to all our listeners, many of them who might themselves be in positions to lead is to move beyond the nominal understanding, have some transparency around the data, be open to the idea that this is important and take advantage of the plethora of resources that you yeah. just identified available. You know, this is not a new issue or concern. It's something that many people have been talking about and trying to deal with for a long time. So. There's lots of entry points. This is also, Chancellor Dan, hard work, you know, and, and it's yeah. taxing work. I wonder what you might share <laughs> with those who are listening today of some of the things that you do to yeah. sort of give yourself the space to yeah. uh, think about mind, body, and soul in addition yeah. to pursuing the work. Yeah, I mean, so this is hard and resilience is really important. Uh, you're gonna get, you know, if you're gonna really make meaningful progress in this area, you have to expect to be really uncomfortable and to get beaten up. It, it's just, and, and I, I've had this experience at pretty much every one of my roles, you know, in the Gates Foundation where, you know, we spent two years on my team, you know, over a period of yeah, long training in that training mode. What did it mean to be an equity investor and engaging in those conversations with program officers, which who are all passionate because they're all at the foundation to change the world in a positive way. And even there, you know, the tensions that exist between folks who have very different, equally passionately held views about how to proceed are tough. Um, and that's true here. Race is a com race, especially, but, you know, also the urban rural divisions, the class issues that intersect, uh, the gender issues that intersect, they are tremendously challenging and people uh, uh, attach themselves to them in a very appropriately passionate way. And if we're good at what we're doing as leaders and making space for that conversation, that passion pours out. And it can sometimes be directed in, in ad hominem and other, you know, personal ways. I, I never, I don't ever believe it's intended in that respect, but sparks fly and they need to in order to get to a common level of understanding. And as a leader, you just have to know that's coming and be resilient. I think the, the second is, uh, is discipline. Um, again, I, I mentioned this before, I can't tell you how important that is because to make progress, even the most incremental takes time and effort. And, 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 and unless, and it sounds silly, but unless that time, unless you make the time, it will not happen, right? So in my leadership team, we set up side, 
you know, a certain amount of time every month to discuss issues of, you know, uh, race equity. Sometimes transactionally, what are we doing about X? But actually, oftentimes, you know, reading a book together. So you want to talk about race was our last one, you know, so we have it's like the book club thing. Um, or just having an open conversation about, you know, free speech is a tremendously challenging issue and how we as education leaders can, you know, encourage good behaviors with respect of, uh, you know, um, how students and others interact with one another and discourage bad behaviors without crossing, you know, first amendment, without stumbling across the first amendment. You know, those are tremendously complicated issues, talking through different perspectives on them. So setting aside that time. And then finally, I guess the third thing is commitment. This is a long-term play. It takes forever. The needle moves slowly and there's a bunch of folks who just want it to move quickly and I'm one of them. Uh, but I think just recognizing that you know there will be setbacks uh things won't move as quickly as you want them to um but it's really important to not get demoralized by those things how, how can you remain deeply deeply devoted uh to a cause which we've been pursuing for 400 some years in this country and have so much more work to do it is you know that can be soul destroying don't let it and you know i guess for me it kind of goes back to my opening remarks. I mean, uh, you know, there's this North Star. I, I, I know what it is. I can talk about it actually in many words and in a few. It's just, for me, it's a commitment to fairness and to equity. Um, and, and just, it's important to know what that North Star looks like, where it is in your personal sky, so that when you get set back or when you, you know, when, when there's a frustrating moment, you can quickly find it again and just pick up and continue on. So, so uh, you know, resilience, discipline, and just sustained commitment uh, to me are the three you know traits as a leader that I would yeah you know, put uh, lift up. I appreciate that, Dan. And if it isn't clear to our listeners now, it should be clear that the Pashi state system is in good hands with someone that's a transformational leader who has a real commitment to equity. And as you opened up in your introduction someone that was raised and nurtured to pursue this line of work. Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you for joining us. It's always a privilege to interact with you and we wanna wish you the best of luck in all you do. Thanks, now I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And thank you to all those who joined us today for PDE Presents. We'll see you next time. Production and technical assistance provided by the Harrisburg branch of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network.